Welcome to Prospects to Pros, the draft podcast that keeps Robert Mays and the Athletic Football Show company here on the Athletic Football Show feed. I'm Andy Staples. He's Dane Brugler. He's Lance Zerline. We got the whole crew together, the whole band together as we rumble toward the combine. But there is that one last football game that got played that we got to talk about. There's a team that, that <coughs> just won the Super Bowl. Uh, that's two in the last four years that they've won. They've been there three times in the last four years. Uh, guys, I think we probably think the Kansas City Chiefs are due for a few more here in the next few years. But it, we, we can talk about Patrick Mahomes all we want. But the Chiefs draft has a lot to do with why they raised raise the Lombardi trophy. So let's let's talk about that first. I mean, you, you had a couple first round picks, Trent McDuffie and George Karloftis. Sky Moore was contributing. Uh, Chanel Cook. I mean, this is this is an incredible draft, all the way down to round seven, where you got Jalen Watson and Isaiah Pacheco, who were massive contributors this season. Mm -hmm. they, it's they been one of the, that's what that's what stands out the, the most, right, Lance? I mean, you, you yeah. get McDuffie in the first, but then to get two corners on day three that are significant contributors. And, and let's be honest, there were times in the Super Bowl against the Eagles where you could you could see the youth, you could see uh, those guys are still figuring things out, but and not just that game, but the entire year, how important they were to that defense, uh, paying immediate dividends. They put a lot on those guys' plates to say, hey, it's sink or swim time. We need you on this defense. And, and you know, what Jalen Watson stepped up. Uh, you had that big pick six against Herbert, the Chargers early in the year. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, I, I think the corners are really what stands out from this draft class. Yeah, I think I think Veach has done a really good job over there with corners. Uh, you know, I, there's there's maybe not a team that I have bigger agreements and bigger disagreements with than the, than some of the Chiefs picks. And um, sometimes I'm right and sometimes I'm wrong. And I was wrong on Jalen Watson. Kid looks really good. He always had the traits, but I, I I don't know. I just I didn't love him on tape. And there's a reason that he went as late as he did. Um, mm -hmm. But he's been terrific. And I mean, Trent McDuffie, I absolutely loved. I thought he was fantastic. Uh, Brian Cook there, and I think the second round played a very important role for the for the the Chiefs this year. You mentioned, I mean, Pacheco has just been, you know, I, I look at my write up of Pacheco, and you think I gave him a high grade, and then I look at the grade, and it just wasn't there. Yeah. And I think I, I got too focused Same. on, I got too focused on some of the things that I think I was trying to nitpick some little things here and there because I'm talking about how he's like a he's like a car with the brake lines cut. He's just you know. He just is completely downhill. I had this, my write up looks like I love him. And then I'm like, how did I give him a five, eight, the five, eight's like a, a six, seventh round pick, but that's where he went. And I'm like, how right. did he go in the seventh round? I, I don't understand this because you could see how frenetic he was as a runner. And that's one of the things I'm really like, I really love guys who play with maybe too much energy. You can always mm -hmm. dial back energy, low right. burn guys it's hard to get low burn guys up. And when I'm watching guys who play with tremendous energy, and there's a lot of these kind of guys this year um, at linebacker and at defensive end, especially edge, who play with just really high motors, high motors. High motor guys get secondary sacks. High motor guys, you know, get plays that get extended. They're the ones who are there making plays. High motor guys are around the football because they're rallying there. When the ball's on the ground, they're, re they're recovering fumbles. High motor guys try to be around the ball at all times. That's why, to me, motor, effort, and strength can absolutely play, whether it's at running back or at linebacker or at, you know, at, at, at offensive line. Guys who just – guys who are a step beyond the average player when it comes to their effort level – they, they tend to translate, and that's Pacheco. Yeah, and I think it's a great example of evaluation and then valuation. You know, because I, I think mm -hmm. I, I'm in the same boat. I I went back to my uh, draft guide, looked up my report on Pacheco, and I'm re this is the final three lines of, his, of my report. Pacheco pounds his typewriter feet with quickness and violence as he picks through congestion and looks for a speed track to show off his wheels. Though his urgent run style is a plus, it also works against him as he battles inconsistent tempo at the line of scrimmage. Uh, he's a fast, energetic runner with a toughness and pass blocking upside to stick in the NFL, but needs to add some patience and pace to his run diet. So, I, I mean, I think, I, like, I'm picturing him with the Chiefs. 
I, I think I nailed it. You know, just like we, what you're saying, Lance. But the valuation was where I was wrong because I gave him a seventh round grade, and that's exactly where he was drafted. So you know, looked good on draft day. But in hindsight, should have valued him much higher because of what he adds with that energy, with those you know, the typewriter feet, where it's just up and down, up and down, just uh, churning away those yards. So it's a it's a good example of that evaluation versus the valuation. You have to get the evaluation part right to understand what type of player he is. But then it doesn't matter if you don't get the valuation right and understand, okay, what is he going to be for our team? Where do we value him in the draft? How do we get him on our squad? So it's it's really a, a you know an important piece of this whole whole process uh, going through the draft. There 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 are Andy, few draft I, stories on this on this Chiefs offense though because i think Kadarius tony is another interesting draft story Kadarius tony's a first round pick the giants couldn't figure out how to use him he goes to the chiefs they take what makes him special and they accentuate that there's a reason Kadarius tony went in the first round if you've ever in person seen Kadarius tony run with a football in his hands you you don't have to have any specialized training you go oh there's something special about that but you also have to know that you're not going to get him to do a ton just in the flow of your offense. That's not how that works. You got to you got to draw up some stuff for him. And it feels like Andy Reid figured out the best ways to use him. I think it goes deeper than that though, Andy, and I think Dane may agree with me here. There were some there were some red flags there on Kadarius yeah. Tony coming out. Lock, and I think you go to a, Listen, he's not that great of a rapper, I understand. You know, no, 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 no. He's trying. I, I, I know. I'm, locker, I'm yeah, yeah. Yeah. The locker room character stuff, and this is a great example of if you were a lesser team like the Giants, and I don't know what their, what their character in the locker room or what their leadership stuff was like in the room. I just know this. It didn't work out, and I think they wanted to get rid of him. They, they were ready to get rid of him. When the new regime came in, they were mm-hmm. more than happy to move on from Kadarius Tony, He had had some issues there. But then when you're a team like Kansas City, who has a strong locker room, has established leaders, you know, you take a chance and you say, hey, we're going to get the best from this guy. And if and when we don't, we'll move on from him. We'll be fine. But he can absolutely help us now. It's what Bill Belichick did with Randy Moss. It's what Bill yeah. Belichick did with uh, Corey, uh, running back from the, from the Bengals. Corey Dillon. Corey Dillon. Corey Dillon, yeah. yeah. At different times, he took guys who had been quote unquote character concerns or difficult locker room guys with other teams, and you say, We'll take them for the talent as long as we have a strong locker room. And I think that's what the Chiefs did is they said, We'll give them a fresh start. We'll give them. No, I think they plan on keeping him. I don't think they're looking at him as a rental player, but he is on his first contract still, and they still have time to, you know, to sift through this. But you're right, Andy. They took a former first rounder another one from another person's draft in 2021 and look at the difference sky Moore scored a touchdown pacheco's i believe but didn't pacheco score i believe i know Jarrett mckinnon didn't and that was the smart play yeah Jarrett yeah. mckinnon didn't but you had <laughs> sky Moore scored who was a draft pick you had uh a, a guy you traded who was a former first rounder and Kadarius tony scored same play but um, yep. and Pacheco had the great game. Didn't hear as much. Did saw Brian Cook. Didn't hear the name uh, as much from uh, uh, Karloftis. But he is the type of high energy, powerful guy that is going to be a factor moving forward. Well, and this is what One you have to do, right? When you have so much of your cap tied up in your quarterback or yep. a defensive playmaker like Chris Jones, you have to go get those. You know, find the value. And so for the Chiefs, that was Kadarius Tony, where you're giving up a third. You know, you're you're giving up something for him. But uh, what he what you think he could bring to your offense? And that's why it was so important for the Chiefs to nail their draft class uh, because they don't have the resources to go out and spend. Uh, you know, the, all these dollars in free agency. Uh, you know, because it's just everything with the cap. And that's what that's how you have to live in the NFL when you have a star quarterback that you're going to pay you have a star on defense and that that's a that's a big chunk of uh where your your money's going so uh, it, it was very important for the chiefs to nail this draft they did and it absolutely paid dividends with the championship yeah they're gonna have to keep doing it because what uh i saw the the stat mahomes is the first quarterback who t- took up more than 12 and a half percent of his team's cap to win the super bowl and yeah. 
you know, that's that's not happened before. I, maybe we're going to see it happen more just because quarterback value, if you're that guy, keeps going up. But that will take a lot of maneuvering on the front office's part and the coaching staff's part to to try to keep fitting the pieces together because they, they traded Tyree Kill because they can't keep a Tyree Kill in this mm -hmm. cap situation. So, yeah, they're going to have to keep doing it. So I, I'm excited to see their draft now because that's what – uh, you know uh, what they what they pick five round five round six round seven i'm gonna be very intrigued by because they sure nailed it this time yeah they did and we're in a different time now where quarterbacks and wide and star wide receivers cost so much money such a huge part of your cap that as dane talked about and as you talked about andy being able to balance your your roster out with with rookie contracts what's ha what's happening now is we're seeing lesser quarterbacks or quarterbacks on rookie contracts are where the A plus wide receivers are being traded now. That's where Eagles, those perfect are example. Traded. Yeah, Eagles, Jalen Hurts, Tua. rookie contract, AJ Brown, Tua. yeah, rookie yep, contract Wilson's with right. uh, with Tyreek Hill and and uh, so I think that's one of the things you're you're gonna have to start looking for is that eventually teams are gonna say and I think the Raiders were basically saying we have to have this work with with Derek Carr. Let's go ahead and bring in the A plus wide receiver and Devontae Adams. But you're going to start seeing more of the teams with the big time quarterbacks. They're going to have to keep drafting wide receivers because they can't afford to keep, not for very long, the high end wide receiver and the high end quarterback. And I mean, the Chiefs, man, what a great example. But it also, it's a cheat code of tight end, right? Just yes. like if you have Travis Kelsey on your fantasy teams, it's a massive advantage because that position is something that there's only going to be two or three of those players that can score like that. You hope. You know, Kelsey used to have Kittle, Waller. There's a very small amount of guys. So it's the same thing in real football. When you have a tight end who can function basically as a wide receiver, it takes less. Look at Tony Gonzalez with the Chiefs for years. Look at Antonio Gates. Phillip Rivers didn't have a bunch of stud wide receiver ones. You have stud tight ends, and you fill in with wide receivers around them. So this actually is a nice transition into Dane's Top 100, which released on The Athletic on tuesday so you mentioned those tight ends you yeah. keep naming those names and i keep thinking about where they got drafted like i remember tim brewster telling me the story about antonio gates brewster is a, is a college assistant now he's with colorado now uh he was at florida state at the time he told me the story but he was with the chargers at the time that they got gates and he'd been scouting him out of kent state and he's just freaking out that somebody's going to steal Antonio Gates because they were just going to sign him. I believe, I think they did sign him or maybe yeah. they drafted him the seventh, but he was freaking out. Cause he's like, is somebody going to steal my discovery? This is my guy. But none of these guys that we've mentioned, Gonzalez went high in the draft, but, but other than that did mm -hmm. not go particularly high in the draft. How is it that these guys are so hard to find? Because I'm looking at the top 100, and you know we we've talked about this is a deep tight end class. Uh, Michael Mayer is the headliner. Notre Dame was was the focal point of their offense. Luke Musgrave from Oregon State, maybe the the you know kind of freakiest of, of this particular bunch. But then there's Darnell Washington. We've talked about him. But Dalton Kincaid at Utah, he's your number 30. Like, is there another one of those cheat code type tight ends in this draft this year? I think it just, it depends what you want. You know, if you really want the the high upside, the guy that you know is a good blocker and he has high upside to be more as a pass catcher than Darnell Washington's your guy. And I think we touched on this before in the pod. It's just, it, it comes down to what type of tight end that you really want for your offense. And so, you know, I, I wouldn't be shocked at all, all if you know my fourth tight end is the first tight end drafted or the third because you know, i think every yeah. team will value it a little bit differently and where what i'm most interested to find out is how early these guys go uh i mean it, it's you have to go back to find the last first round tight end that has really lived up to being a first round tight end it's not a long list over the last 10 years so how does that affect and a lot of teams you know, they, they buy into that uh, theory where, you know, we feel like we can wait. We don't, we don't have to take one in the top 25 picks, but, but the talent this year. such a weapon now, like Travis Kelsey right. is such a weapon. Like, why would you not prioritize finding the next one of those in your you are, draft? You are now. And, 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 yeah. And I think, and I think you if you, 
Dalton Kincaid, if you think that if, if you want to find the closest thing to a Travis Kelsey or at least what you think Travis Kelsey uh, or what you think a, a guy like Dalton Kincaid could be, I, I think you'd be comfortable drafting him in the top 20. But that's it's a little it's a real bit of a roll dice, uh, a, a dice roll at that point uh, to draft a tight end that early that, you know, is is, is not a, a clean the most clean prospect. But he at least has, I, I think, the high upside to potentially reach that type of level. I, I know you really like Kincaid, too. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I like Mike Gesicki a lot coming out, and people weren't as high yeah. on him as I was. But the reason – I've started looking at guys as just tell me who they are and then play them, play them for who they are. Dalton mm-hmm. Kincaid, so many people get focused on <clears> – you know, we're Jane and I are writing up draft prospects for 32 teams for all these different schemes. And I started – I started – because what the, what the board looks like for San Francisco is going to look way different than what the board looks like for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Right based on schematics and what you need. <clears throat> so if we hyper-focus on, well, Dalton, Dalton Kincaid's not a very good blocker. Who cares? If you're playing him in the slot as a as a as an ad, you know who else wasn't a great blocker? Antonio Gates wasn't a great blocker. Right. Um, mm-hmm. um, um he, was great at, he was great at blocking out. To yeah, get rebounds, yeah, but. <laughs> exactly. But who are they? Like, what do they do well? Well, Dalton Kincaid is a really good pass catcher. He's smart with his routes. He's got incredible hands. Uh, he's got great instincts in space. Like, okay, that's what I want actually from the slot. We want to start mismatching people from the slot. Great. Then you need to elevate your grade on Dalton Kincaid. Do you want him mm-hmm. to block a lot? No, we got another why. Okay, then why do I care about his blocking? Now, if I'm if I'm the San Francisco 49ers, I actually like my two tight end sets, both of them to be able to 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 mm-hmm. reach a certain level as as a blocking team. Because my my idea is I like two tight ends because I know I can mismatch you into thinking it's a big personnel grouping when really it's a passing grouping anytime we want it to be. So I want to be able to run if you go small and throw if you go big. And so I think right now, Andy, it's you're going to see it happen this year. It's a great question that you ask because the value hasn't quite been there. And of course, you could talk yourself into saying, well, look where George Kittle was drafted. He was like the fifth. Look where Look where Kitt, look where um, Kittle, got, Kittle got trashed by his own school coming out of college. That's that's part of the problem. Right. I mean, yeah. and there's none of these first rounders, but these are all guys like Luke Musgrave in years past would have been a, a second, maybe a third. Dalton Kincaid mm-hmm. would not have been a first. He doesn't block at all. Michael Mayer maybe would have hit the first. Um, now I think there's an understanding, A, the position is important, and B, you know what? What do they do, and do they fit my scheme and what they do well? Like if you really want a wide tight end, then Mayer's your guy. That guy is going to yep. get after it as a run blocker. And he can catch 56 passes. It's not going to be a problem. Maybe he can become – he's not as athletic as as uh, Mark Andrews. But, you know, there's another one who was not a first-round pick. You know, Mark mm-hmm. Andrews. Look how important he's yep. been with for for, for uh, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, and, and I mean, it, it goes – I mean, Zach Ertz. I mean, yeah, we can go on and on with guys that – Can't block. Were produ- can't block. Yeah, no, really exactly. Say, can't block. Exactly. And so and that's – in in today's game – or, you know – Zach Ertz, he might be a top 30 pick in the draft because of what he can do as a receiver coming out. And that's that's what Dalton Kincaid, there's some similarities there. So, yeah, and that's what the problem is with doing a top 100 like this, where, you know, I've got uh, Quentin Johnston and Jackson Smith and Jigba, uh, you know, tags are touching, pretty close grades, but for very different reasons. They're, they're completely different prospects. Um, and, you know, it's not like they're, you know, they almost play two for different positions. So even though, yes, they're both receivers, it, it, it's it makes it tough when you're you're stacking these guys and it's the prime uh, prime examples these tight ends because you you stack them and yes we have our rankings but they're very different uh in, in what they do and each team is going to value them differently so it, it does make it tough when doing an exercise like this I, I almost feel like we should create some new positions like the draft world brought us the the idea of an edge rusher because mm-hmm. an edge can be a couple of different things. It can be your your traditional four three defensive end, but it could also be an outside linebacker who plays in an odd front who walks up and plays on the line of scrimmage most of the time. But the fact of the matter is, it's a person who's coming after the quarterback, and that's their main job. Like I feel like we should have two different tight end positions, which they do in the in the football world. Like it, you know what a Y means, and if you're a yeah. coach, but we maybe you know what an F as, is. Yeah, as right. draft media, we should. Put these out when we're ranking the prospects and say, this is a Y. This is an F. With receivers, 
I do this in my right. This is a but, slot. This is a this yeah, is a pick. This it. is an outside guy. Yeah. So I think it, right. I think the answer to that, what I like to re- describe him as, is big slots. So I remember mm-hmm. when uh, little Jordan Humphrey was coming out for Texas. To me, you can't get open. Like he can't get open outside. He's not fast enough. He's not sudden enough. But I thought he had a chance if he was a quote unquote tight end. But really, it's just a big slot. Yeah. You know, because it's a big slot. Who's a big? What does a big slot do? Well, big slot has a chance to mismatch. You love it if they block a little bit. Because then, like Elijah Higgins from from uh, Stanford, that's a big slot now. You can call him move tight end, F. You can call him whatever you want. But if I put him in a slot and you put a linebacker on him, that linebacker's cooked for the most part. If you want to put a, a safety or a small corner, I might be able to, to get after you in the run game and run out of 11 personnel. So I like to just call it big slot because I have no, I have no qualms over – the idea that some teams are not going to ask their tight ends to do a ton of blocking. And if you're playing the same position as, you know, if you're, if, if that's the case, then you're a big slot. That means you have mismatch potential and that's, that's who you are to me. I mean, we can call it F teams will call it F's, but yeah, I call right. it big slot because to me, it can take in a 225 pound wide receiver. It can take in a 230 pound wide receiver. It can take a 235 pound wide receiver that you know should translate to, to tight end, just like Higgins from Stanford this year. Yeah, it's more, what, I know it's that more it, what do you do than, than what position are you? Right, exactly. Right, and I know, Lance, you do something similar, but it, if you read any of my scouting reports, the last line under summary it, for me is always, this is what he projects as, whether it's, yeah. it, 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 you know, he's a three technique, uh, you know, he's a weak side backer, he's uh, you know, he's more of a nickel corner. Uh, you know, it, it's always trying to be as specific as possible. Uh, you know, we, we have these big buckets, corner, they're a safety, they're a, a tackle. But then uh, it, for me, uh, in my write ups, when I get down to the summary, that's where I really get into detail. And, you know, that last line is always the most specific as I can get. You know, he's, you know, he can only play in an odd front or whatever it may end up being. Yeah. So, you Absolutely. know, it's, Right, exactly. It's you try to you use these big buckets, but then once we get into the nitty gritty of the report, you try to uh, you know really get as narrow as possible with the projection. Well, that's what uh, Jimmy Graham would appreciate us having this conversation. He had to go to arbitration when he got franchise tagged. He lost. I think I think we'd have gotten him some money if if we'd have had this conversation before. Hundred <laughs> percent. I Dane, I, I want to talk to you a little more about the the top one hundred. There's a couple guys in here that that jumped out at me. Uh, one is your number 48, and that's Jervon Dexter from Florida, defensive tackle. This is a guy I remember. I went on a, a Florida-centric podcast before this season, and, and they're like, well, how come he's not getting more draft buzz, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, because his production is not there mm-hmm. compared to you look at him, size, speed, he looks like a million bucks. And I'm curious what you saw from from this year's tape and and why you put him here uh his production still not great but again still looks like a million bucks yeah i I gave him a mid second round grade and it's a lot of it is traits based um it's betting that there is more in that body than we have seen uh he's got basketball feet basketball body control uh you know he, he was really a basketball player until he returned to football as a junior in high school so and he's only a three-year junior at Florida. So he's been really been playing serious football for five years now. There's still a lot we haven't seen from him that I think we're going to, if he goes to the right place and develops, um, I, he carries his weight extremely well. Uh, you wish there was more backfield production to show for it. There's no doubt. Uh, I, I think the biggest thing for him is uh, it, it could be traced all to his leverage. When he He's a very different player when he utilizes the, those long levers. He plays low because he is six five and a half. He's a taller guy. Uh, when he does that, when he does play with leverage, you see him put uh, blockers on skates. Uh, but there are times where, especially when he's laid off the ball, which happens too much, uh, you know, he's not able to do that. So I, I'm betting on the guy that you know, has that size. He's 6'5", 315, a big, agile, uh, coordinated big man who has yet to play his best football. And I think he has versatility up and down the line. So it's just a matter of going to the right place and developing each year. So, uh, you know, it's, it is a little bit of a, you know, faith-based projection because you're looking at the traits and saying, okay, he's going to get better. And I understand why not everyone's going to be as high on him because it, it does take a leap of faith. Lance, I think you are one of those people who's not necessarily as high on him. Um, yeah, I'm not as high on him. I've got more of a backup grade on him. I just, I just kind of graded the tape. Sometimes, you know, it's, 
it's weird. I, I, I will say, and I don't know if this is a positive or a negative, but I, my process is not uh, static. It's very fluid. So for some guys, I'll lean more heavily on the traits. Like with uh, uh, Keon White, it's interesting, though. I was watching a Keon White game. Who was I watching? He was going up against Clemson. And, man, the Clemson, uh, Jordan McFadden really – had some great reps against Keon White, and that's game one, but it really bothered me a little bit because he was also a little inconsistent at the senior bowl, I thought. So um, mm-hmm. I kind of pushed him up the board on traits, and now I'm like, yeah, maybe I need to back him off because initially I had him where Dane has him, but then mm-hmm. I, I moved him up after I saw him on the on the hoof, so to speak, in the pads, what he looks like physically. Because I do, you know, I have been taught to really – uh, really covet traits because the guys who end up being the best players many times – are bigger, faster, stronger, longer. It's historically the case. But there are other times where I, if I don't see something on tape that makes me think that you can project with the traits and can get better, um, it bothers me. And with Dexter, I just, I, and you saw him, Andy. You know him. I don't, I'm interested to yeah, see Yeah, with more. Dexter, I, I'd be curious to see him around better talent mm-hmm. because, you know, it's interesting in the SEC, you're used to when you see a kind of a top 100 D lineman type, he's got a lot of other. NFL talent around him usually that really wasn't the case for Dexter and I feel like there was a lot he he was asked to do quite a bit he was asked to play probably more snaps than than a guy his size normally would so I'll be curious to see when he's in an NFL environment when everybody else is really good too does that help him does that does that make him a little bit better does he feel like he's not trying to carry everything I don't know. It may just be that that's what he is. It may be that he looks great, but he does not produce that much. But I, I get, I get where you guys are coming from with the traits because you cannot make a human that size, right? That agile. You can only draft that. You, you have those. I mean, you have those guys every year, and they, especially on the D line, they get drafted higher than you think. I don't know where I projected him. I'd have to see where I projected him to go, but. Big long guys get dra- who have certain body types. They, they, they will get they'll get drafted higher than it's a hundred percent. It happens all the time. You know right. the little talented guys with more production. Sometimes teams just they get put into a bucket, and that bucket is means okay, we like you, but we like you fifth, sixth, seventh. Doesn't mean we don't like you, but your traits aren't high enough for us to right. put you. You know because even the fourth round is kind of that bucket where we keep guys a lot of times that either separators either because they are they're missing maybe a level of speed but they're really really productive sometimes you see that with line inside linebackers um or even wide receivers or high-end traits guys who are raw and need development a lot of times you stick them in the fourth round yeah and that that makes sense another d lineman i want to talk about interior guy this is a guy we all saw at the senior bowl uh tommy out of a warrior out of northwestern his North, uh, his Ohio State game is one of my favorites. Uh, I enjoyed yeah. watching him play a lot against Ohio State on a day when uh, when nobody could throw the ball because the wind was blowing so hard. But he uh, actually, among the D linemen, was the second fastest in terms of that. Uh, I don't remember what system they were using, but the GPS system. He came in second fastest among all the D linemen, and that included the edge rushers uh, behind you, um, Keon White, which you yeah. know, Keon White is a freak. So the fact that this guy, who's a, a an interior guy, probably a three technique, is moving like this, holding his own, I, I, that feels pretty impressive. You got him at number six, uh, excuse me, number 96, Dane. This is one I, I and I, I talked to him a little bit after one of the practices. He's a, a, that's a dude who will do pretty much anything you ask him to do. And I always, I just always appreciate that. Yeah, he, he was uh, really singled out and credited with, quote unquote, rebuilding uh, the culture of that team. Uh, that, that's what the coaches say. So, you know, and he's a guy that doesn't have the best feedback from NFL teams. Um, you know, the feedback I get is all uh, mid round day three, but after just seeing him, what he did at the senior bowl, those one-on-ones and just the way he was competing, I, I had to sneak him in there into the top 100. So I don't know. We'll see if he ends up going that high. But, you know, he, he's a guy that, you know, had talk about, you know, maybe the opposite of Dexter, where doesn't necessarily have some of the measurables that you're looking for, uh, but he has the production. And you know what? He just comes keep coming at you. He's got those really freaky uh, strength room numbers, which translate to the field, uh, a natural three technique where, uh, you know, he does a nice job of 
he's playing quick, so he doesn't allow the center to reach him. Um, mm-hmm. and, but he also has that that power where he can push guys on their heels and really disrupt the what's going on in the backfield. So, uh, what kind of grade did you have on uh, Atabare, uh, uh, Lance? Um, I had when I first started, I had what would be a sixth because I, you know, I didn't love the fact he's six one and a half, two seventy five. I mean, pure tweener. He is. I don't think he has enough. He didn't have enough edge rush, right, to stay at DN. Then I'm like, I just don't know if you can bump him inside. He's we got to see the ta- we got to see the physicality. And then I bumped him up to a 61, which is um, good backup to potential low end eventual starter. And that's because when you see him in person, his leverage is so unbelievable. He's so strong. He's long. He's, it, he's long. He's 30. 33 inches. So at at, yeah. so at just under six two, that's a long player. And so. Yeah. He can get into, you know, he gets into players quickly. He's going to be under all the offensive linemen he plays. He's not going to play anyone six can, foot can, one. Can, can I give you guys a comp? Yeah. Geno Atkins. He's a little wow. bit smaller than Geno coming out of college. Yeah, Geno was around 290 something. And you know, I'm yeah. kind of wondering if Kalijah Kansi is, but I don't think Kalijah is as powerful at the point of attack as, as Tommy is. He's he's no. he's more powerful. And so now, now I'm saying, okay. How are we going to use him? Well, what we're going to do is maybe play him on base downs as a run defender, and then I'm going to bump him inside to rush as a sub package rusher. Now, all of a sudden, I can get behind my grade a little bit easier, and I can push him up. And that's what I did. I mean, it's a Darius Rush. I had a lower grade on Darius Rush. I thought he looked really good at the senior bowl. thought he had a good oh, senior yeah. bowl. Had to move him up. Yep. He, he moved up to my top 80, 79, I think. Um because of what he did in Mobile, I mean, he was he was outstanding, uh, and he might keep keep moving up. I don't know, we'll see. But uh, yeah, Darius Rush looks like a guy that belongs on day two. So one of the other things that jumped out about your your top one hundred, Dane, is uh, when you get you know starting in the forties, eh, there's a little run on running backs here. You've got Devon A. Chain at, at forty four, who uh, you and I both love. We've talked about him a little bit, but but I'm curious, you know, as he compares to some of these other guys, because it. This is almost like our tight end conversation. It's kind of the flavor that you want, uh, depending on what you need for your offense. Zach Charbonnet from UCLA, you have at 64. Very different type of guy. Tank Bigsby from Auburn. Uh, that one, I am really interested to see him as an NFL player because I don't think he's run behind a good O-line yet. So I, yeah. I, like, I'd love to see if he does happen to get on a team that has a good offensive line. But Roshan Johnson from Texas, you've got at 78. You got Eric Gray from Oklahoma at 89 and, uh, you know, Kendra Miller from TCU at 92. There's a lot there. Now, I, I'm curious in terms of positional value. We don't think all these guys are actually going to go in the top 100, right? Or some of these are going to be a little bit lower down and you're going to be able to grab them, right? It's a log jam. And, you know, I mentioned this on Twitter yesterday, but it's also what might hurt a guy like Bijan Robinson in the first. Uh, when teams look at, the running backs that'll be available in the third round, fourth round, they, you know, yeah, we, we really like Bijan. He'd be good value for us here, but you know what? We could also, you really use a tackle or we could really use another corner. And so we're going to do that in the first round and we'll wait on running back. Uh, it, it's something that could work against a running back. Who's really one of the best talents in this draft, but uh, it, it's hard to find that exact landing spot for him. Uh, yeah. I think there's that third, fourth round, there's gonna be a log jam of these backs. Um, and, and it just, you know, they're all a little bit different with what they offer. You know, Ty J Spears, uh, the medical is going to be big for him, but he's right there in that mix. Um, you know, Eric Gray, I like quite a bit, uh, but you know, to your point, Andy, not all these guys are going to go into top 100. So there are going to be some really talented running backs available, uh, in that early fourth round. So it's, uh, it's something that as teams look at their roster and they, you know, like the Cowboys are a great example where, okay, they can move on from Zeke uh, and shed some of that contract. Uh, Pollard is a free agent. Uh, you know, what are they going to do there? So they, they've got some decisions. I, to I'm telling you with that, with it. that line, if they take tank yeah. Bigsby in the, in this you know, late second, early third, they won't well, miss it, it, anybody. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great point by you because watching Bigsby on tape, you get the feeling that you know he he felt like he had to to do everything like you felt like mm-hmm. he had to create on his own he had to to make something out of nothing on every single play but yeah if you get him to be a little bit more uh you know specific to the run design and stick to it uh, I, I trust actually trust the blocking in front of him 
uh, yeah, he's got a lot of the phys- the physical uh, traits that you want at the position. So, yeah, it's it's just a logjam of, of guys at that running back position once you get into that late second, third round, fourth round. Uh, and, and, you know, some guys will have – or some evaluators will have Kendra Miller a little bit higher. Some will have um, a guy like, uh, you know, Zach Evans a little bit lower. It, it's, it's really – there'll be a lot of different orders of these running backs and how they come off the board. And and it will be interesting to see who's left after that top 100. I'll tell you what, a guy who's not getting talked about, and I know I'm turning this into a running back conversation, but. Oh, it's a running back conversation. Let's Yeah. Well, I mean, I know it's not in Dane's top 100, but Muhammad Ibrahim. Yeah. Dude. I mean, what he did against Ohio state to start the season before he tore his ACL in 2021, he was crushing them in that game crushing yeah. them and then you know he tore his acl he came back this year same workhorse if they need it now look here's the how problem much, how much tread evaluated. is on the tires yeah like he runs like damian pierce does only damian pierce yeah. didn't have hardly any runs in college and ibrahim has a lot of tread off the tires so when i look at Mohamed ibrahim okay he's a one contract guy for me more than likely because yeah. i'm gonna run I'm probably looking at him as I can't touch him until the fourth at the earliest based on who he's Mm going to be and what he's going to be for me. But I think the value you get from him is, you know, that he runs low to the ground, he breaks tackles and he is a guy that, you know, on a team like Kansas city, for example, how Pacheco just kind of took over the team in place of a former first rounder. You could stick Ibrahim on. um, I don't, I mean, you could stick him on the Ravens. And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. Ibrahim is just – maybe other guys aren't staying on the field, ironically enough. And this is a guy who is just every run, he's giving you everything he's got. And I think he is a really good second back. If you've got a back that maybe isn't as big a hammerhead, maybe you take him as your hammerhead complimentary back, knowing that if your first guy goes down, this guy has no problems taking on 24 carries in the game. That's not going to be an issue. Right. I mean, he's not the most elusive. He's not going to run well. No. Um, he, he's not a proven pass catcher. So, you know, those are the things working. Plus the durability, obviously, you know, the medicals that need to check out with his past mm-hmm. injuries. Uh, yeah, the, the the ruptured Achilles, the big one. So that's those are the things you worry about. But if you know, once you get past that, it's you see a guy that's a no nonsense runner um, and teams, coaches, they're just going to appreciate the decisiveness, the vision, the power. So now I would tend to agree with you. I think once you get to day three, he's the type of running back you look at and say, okay, you know, for our team with what we do, he'd be a really good fit as a number two on our running back depth chart. The the other guy I wanted to ask both of you about is Zach Charbonnet at UCLA, uh, transferred from Michigan. He's he's two twenty, but he's six one. They list him at six one. I'm I'm not sure exactly what he'll measure at at the at the combine, but. He he just feels like a very interesting one to me because I, I I don't even know that they they scratch the surface of what, of what he can he can do. It, it, he's easy to like because I think he does a little bit of everything. I mean he's uh, he's really good as a pass catcher, especially in the screen game. Um, he you know is all purpose. I think he led he led all of F- FBS in all purpose yards per game. Um, yeah, his vision is outstanding. Uh, really love his vision. Uh, you know, he, he's able to absorb contact really well. I love his balance. Um, it big, he's just, he's an average athlete. You know, it, it, the burst is average. Uh, the speed is average. So you just don't see a lot of home runs on his tape, but I tell you what, he's going to lead the league in doubles. Uh, I mean, he's, he's a really good, you know, he, you don't see a lot of 20, 30, 40 yard gains, but 10 yard gains, 12 yard gains, 15 yard gains, he piles those up. So not a dynamic start stop athlete. But the vision, the patience, the pass catching, uh, even as a blocker, I think he's he's above average in all those all those areas. And, I, and everything I've heard from coaches, both at Michigan and UCLA, the football character is outstanding. So this is this is almost like a, a Nick Chubb, but if Nick Chubb was kind of like an average athlete, or you know, just not the type of athlete that makes Chubb one of the best in the in the, in the league, you know, that that's the type of prospect Charbonnet is. Yeah, I you know it's funny. Last year I wrote him up because I thought he was coming out. And um, I had a man, I, I barely wrote anything on the the negative column. I didn't write them all the way up. Actually, I was I got through a lot of his tape and I, and I was thinking, man, I'm going to have to kind of nitpick some negatives here. And then um, I watched him this year and I just saw him differently. And I, I reached out and asked 
a friend of mine in the league, I said, do you ever, you ever see a guy one year and you see one thing, you see him the next year and you see him kind of differently? He said, yeah, it happens all the time. And that kind of happened for me. Charbonnet, I just saw this first round running back last year. Now he's got great traits, but this year I saw him and, and I was more aware of when he stopped the stop start stuff, Dane, when he slowed his feet, he's not the same back. Um, yeah. And that's not unusual. Derrick Henry is, is like that. I mean, Derrick Henry is an mm-hmm. elite back, but to me, one thing that I've noticed, Andy, and you'll appreciate that as a college football guy is I hate when there are certain downhill backs that you know should be featured in an I formation because mm-hmm. they have longer legs and they got to get downhill. They're probably off tackle or outside zone type backs who need to get the legs rolling. When you stick them in offset formations, I hate that because it it doesn't allow them to do what they you're not putting them in the best situation. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just, it it drives me nuts to it's almost like watching Fred Flintstone trying to start the car. <laughs> yeah, basically exactly. because it, it is hard to move from that spot and you got to be pretty special stop start to to do that to take the ball and then boom you're 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 moving i mean shoot isn't that why uh the the oklahoma when they had adrian peterson lined him up seven yards behind the line of scrimmage because once mm-hmm. his legs got moving you couldn't do anything with him <laughs> like he was unstoppable so yeah i i i'm with you so this goes back to what we're talking about with the chiefs though if you just know what you're drafting and know what you're you're bringing onto your team and why you're bringing them onto your team, I think that makes all the difference in the world. Mm-hmm. Sure. There's no doubt. And, uh, you know, it's that's what's where the evaluation part is so critical. And because it's not all prospects are, are wrapped in transparent wrapping paper, you know, it, it's it, you got to do some digging and understand, OK, you know, they're doing this, they're doing uh, this type of scheme, uh, but you know, how would he translate to ours and how does he translate to our locker room and our culture? And I mean, there, there's just so many, that's where scouts have to be, uh, you know, more than just talent evaluators, you know, they, they have to really dive deep in those things. So it's, it, it's definitely a big part of the process. The other thing is when I hear people say, well, is this guy an overall cornerback? Like, is he an overall wide receiver? I, I, I brought this up with Jalen Hyatt last week, which is, I know what Jalen does well. If I'm going to draft them, I'm drafting them for a very specific reason. It's the same thing when you look at cornerbacks that are 6'1", that run, you know, a 4'5", 240, that are long-armed, that don't really – they may not be able to mirror and match out of a pedal. I'm not playing them that way. I'm pressing them or I'm playing cover three with them. And, you know, Seattle had a very specific type of corner. Uh, San Francisco has specific kind of corners. I'm drafting corners that make sense for what I do. The same way that that the the old Bears, you know – Four three one gapping, Rod Marinelli up the field. There's a certain kind of defensive tackle you're drafting. There's a certain kind of defensive end you're drafting. So that's why their draft boards and a lot of people can't understand this, and I don't know why. The draft board for um, the draft board for Kyle Shanahan's team, which has a very specific type of defensive player and a specific type of offensive player, it's going to look way way different. Then, and the same thing with the Cleveland Browns, for example, it's going to look much different mm-hmm. than what the um, maybe the Tennessee Titans have. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's going to look the, or then Bill Bill Belichick. You know what Bill Belichick loves? Two hundred and fifty pound bangers at linebacker. He yeah. likes old school linebackers. Look at who he drafts. You know who doesn't? The rest of the league. But Bill <laughs> Belichick is still drafting theatric wise. You know what he's going to draft? Six foot five, long arm defensive ends who may not have the greatest edge rush, but they're long, powerful. He has a type. I, I well, I eagerly look forward to New England Patriot Noah Sewell. So I'm glad you <laughs> yeah. glad you mentioned that, dude. dude yeah. I thought about the Patriots when I wrote up Noah Sewell because I'm like, man, this is a this guy's a Patriot. Uh, yeah. I watched that in Shaka. You probably know him, Dane. I didn't know him until yesterday. Shaka um, Hayward. I mean, yeah. he is a bone rattling linebacker when he hits Duke. and i thought he's gonna run like a four seven something patriot yep exactly <laughs> no and, and it, to your to your jalen hyatt point like you know a lot of people will point out like the the route tree and yeah we touched on this last week uh and, and you had a great twitter thread on it I, I just keep going back okay i went back to last year and seeing what christian watson did for the packers uh yeah he's a little bit longer than what jalen hyatt is but Hyatt it has, you know, the same, if not better speed. And he actually can catch the football. I mean, he's got actual ball skills where Christian Watson's a little bit of a coin flip. 
Uh, so you're telling me that Jalen Hyatt can't come in and have the same type of impact at minimum that Christian Watson did, you know, if you use, if you use them that way, you know, so it's, yeah, I I think that's a big part of this equation is understanding what they do best and then making sure you're using them in that way. Well, it, it it is, it is going to be fun. And, and yet, first of all, if you're a coach or a GM who needs people who are great at all of the facets of a position, well, you're not going to last very long because those people are gone in the first 10 picks and then you you move on to everybody else. So this is this is about uh, Lance. Real quick, can I I, I want uh, yeah. I want to ask you the biggest disagreement and put you on the spot. Biggest disagreement from my top 100 compared to uh, to, to your rankings. Uh, was there anybody that stood out that you have significantly higher or lower <laughs> uh, just ba- based off my uh, recent update. First of all, Dane and I actually see players fairly similarly. That's the first yeah. thing I want to say. We've got, I mean, we've got a lot of similar, we're always going to have differences. Everybody does. Dane and I actually see players fairly similarly for the most part. And I see players similarly with Daniel Jeremiah, who I, you know, who he and I talk about players. I would say the guy I have at number 70, you have at number 10. That would probably be the biggest difference. Will Levis. Yep. I just yeah. I just gave him a grade. I, I Over the years, I've given quarterbacks grades based on – I kind of pushed them to where I think they'll get drafted. I moved them yeah. up. I, I tend to move them up. And this year I said, you know what? I'm going to sit down and say this is who I think the guy is going to be, and I'm going to give him a grade and wherever it ends up in the – now, if I had to stack it, there's a difference between my grade and my stacking. If I had to stack it, Will Levis, because he's a quarterback – I just think as a quarterback, he's going to end up as a 6.2, an average NFL starter. That's not bad. That's actually not bad. But a 6.2 well, that's a, that's is a multi, multi millionaire, is what that is. Yeah, it's a multi millionaire. But if I had to stack it, I'm probably pushing him up into the 40s, if you really want to know the truth, because he does have, I mean, he does have upside. I do think that I haven't really bolstered him based on the fact that he was injured last year. I may do that later in the process. Because if he looks really good at, at the combine or at his pro day and he's throwing with better accuracy, then, you know, it just makes you think. It just makes you think because arm talent and high end ability. But I don't want to fall into this Josh where everyone's Josh Allen. It makes you, you know, it's just a coping mechanism. With you. Well, it could be the next Josh Allen because we're all doing that with Richardson and Levis. And yeah, it could be, could be. And maybe there's, there's the next Tom Brady and the next Michael Jordan, but Man, those those things. It can also be the the class. next Paxton then, Lynch. It's, Ooh, well, hey, what? But what? Well, you know, what, look at look at Jalen Hurts. You know, I mean, the guy we just saw in the Super Bowl, who is a very Im- much improved passer from the guy we saw at Alabama and Oklahoma. You know, and I think the the root of that is the competitiveness and how you know just all the intangibles that he brings. Where yeah. I think Will Levis has some of that. He had. I'm not calling him the same level as as Jalen Hurts in, in, in that manner. Tough but leader. He has intelligent. Uh, I mean, he he. Had, I think he has the highest wonder lake of all these quarterbacks. Like he, there's a lot that's you know intangible wise that I think will uh, endear him to coaches. And you know that's and that's an, an another part of the resume that makes you think. And you know, okay, this guy, he's you know, he's not afraid to fail. Like you know, he throws a pick. He's like, okay, you know, it comes back. And he's going to keep, you know, trying to, uh, you know, he's not going to let it bother him. He doesn't bring that baggage with him from play to play. So uh, it's some of that that also makes his evaluation a little tricky. Yeah, it's go ahead, Lance. No, no, no. That's what I was. I was just going to say that uh, Levis is hard. Richardson's yep. hard. They both require yep. projections. You can't rely on tape. But frankly, I think I think Stroud is a projection based on one game. Yeah, for where I have him, I pushed him well above where I expected to have him based on a Georgia Same game. Here. Bryce Same Young here. is my only guy who I say I'm sitting on the tape, and my my grade yeah. is going to be based on the tape. And he's the guy that's under six foot and under two hundred pounds. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's how it works out this year. This, this draft is going it's to funny. challenge all of your conventional quarterback wisdom. That's that's just what it's going to do. There's no but such thing. That's all right. It's going to be fun to talk about as we as we move forward. We are getting really close to the combine here. Guys, it's been a pleasure. We'll talk again next week.